Hey guys, this is Hunter Levine, and thank you for listening to The Captain's Collective, where we travel around and hang out with different guides and industry leaders. And in today's episode, we sit down with Captain Jordan Todd of Saltwater Obsessions. Jordan is located in the Port St. Joe area and fishes along the northwest coast of Florida. And in this podcast, we talk about the good and bad of Hurricane Michael, how his mom shaped him as an angler, his degree in marine biology, how he would work to find new clients through side jobs and coaching. Jordan is a hard worker and a down-to-earth guy who is building a great business, and I hope that you enjoy this time that we had with him. Thanks for listening. This is The Captain's Collective. Success is a gift. Excellence is the only thing to strive for. He tried to eat it. He tried to eat it. Hit him, hit him, hit him. He got him. He's on. Hit him, hit him, hit him. Two butt caps off the rods, filled them with tequila. We took a shot and out we went. There, there ain't no getting into it after that. It's you're, you're hooked. It's a bad habit. And all the time, flips the he's standing there ready to go for a tarpon. Anytime he says, "You talk so much, you're like a senator." All right. Hey, Jordan, thanks for joining us. If you don't mind just giving us a little bit of background about how you got into fishing and a little bit about your family history and eventually work us towards when you began to guide. All right. Uh, so I'm fifth generation resident, um, Port St. Joe, Apalachicola area. My, uh, my ancestors were one of the very first families that ever settled Apalachicola way back when, um, back when it was, you know, that's all they had was, was the the river and the seafood business and the industries and all that kind of stuff. So my family's been around fishing for generations. Um, as a kid growing up, we had a beach house uh, at Indian Pass. It was one of the first ones out there. And Every summer, I mean, the day school got out, we were at the beach house and we had no TV, no phones. Uh, you know, it was, you wake up, you fish, what you know you ate what you caught and uh that's that's how i grew up as a kid so i was always around fishing um in that aspect you know never really thought much of it it's just how i was raised and then as i got a little older you know had some problems family problems mom and dad splitting up um i was a fat kid growing up really fat kid <laughs> a lot of people made fun of me uh and uh, so I used fishing as my escape to get away from all that. Um, you know, I had easy access to it. So I just spent a lot of time on the water by myself fishing to get away. Um, I always been an observant person, so I just started watching and, and observing and, and ab- absorbing everything from the water. And always kind of knew, you know, like this is what I want to be around. This is what I want to do you know, for the rest of my life, something in, in and around water with the marine, the marine life or whether it was fishing or whatever. Um, so I promised my mother, my, my grandmother that I'd go to college and get a degree. Um, cause I wanted to, to jump right in to fishing somehow. Mm-hmm. Um, but I was a smart kid in high school. So got a degree or got accepted to Stetson University went Mm -hmm. to Stetson got a degree in aquatic marine biology um so you know basically my whole childhood growing up everything was always focused on the water something like that you you went off to Stetson was your first stop back just back straight to the Apalachicola Port St. Joe area yeah I came I came straight home um worked five jobs for about eight months and just saving money, saving money, bought a boat, got my ca- captain's license. What was I, the, what was the boat? It was a, a 202 back country pro guide back country. Okay. Um, had a two old 225, uh, HPDI motor on it. It would scream. I mean, it runs 70 miles an hour. I blew the motor up twice, spent more money fixing it, but it was my boat, you know, that's the one I was going to start my business. And I had a five year plan, mm-hmm. um, that I wanted to see where guiding would take me. And man, it's been, it's been a dream. You know, I, 
I've built a very good business. Mm -hmm. Um, I get to do what I love every day. So it's what I'm going to do for the rest of my life, hopefully. And then as you were kind of going from that, that season of graduating college to becoming a guide, what were some of those jobs and did you have any helpful carryover from them into becoming a guide? Yeah. So every job was in the entertainment, you know, service industry. I was, I, uh, shucking oysters at the Indian pass raw bar, which I had done since I was 13. You know, that was always my summer job if, if I needed one or, um, so that was big. Um, I worked at a bait and tackle store, uh, out on Cape San Blas, um, bartended, you know, so I was always face to face interacting with people and there was always people, you know, talking about, man, I want to, you know, do you know anyone that knows how to fish or can take me fishing? Um, so I actually started taking people then, you know, Mm -hmm. off and on working, uh, you know, getting a little money, not legally. Don't tell your dad, you know, yeah. back then. <laughs> uh, so that's really kind of what spurred me into wanting to get my license. It's like, you know what, this is fun. You know, people that want to go fishing, that don't know the area, that don't know how, let me let me see if I can, you know, make a living at doing that. And, and somewhere in there you started coaching some high school football on the yeah, side so too. Yeah, so that was that – was, uh, yeah, it was a, I was a volunteer for five years when I came back. Um, and I played football and baseball in high school, uh, a little bit of baseball in college. And loved the, loved the game. And, you know, I, I came back and, and uh, my head coach from high school asked, he's like, mm-hmm. hey, do you want to help out? You know, like, yeah, sure, whenever I have time. So me being me, when I say, yeah, I'll help out, uh, you know, you go all in. Oh, I, yeah, I dive right in 100%. So, um, never missed a practice, never missed a game. And I would imagine there would be a lot of carryover from coaching people on the football field and then having people come on the boat as a, as a captain. It, it helped me tremendously. So, the biggest thing with guiding is you got to learn how to take people fishing that don't know how to fish like you. So, you know, you know how to fish. I know how to go out and catch whatever I want to catch. But corresponding that, you know, with people that don't have a clue what to do, it, it was it was tough, and coaching did help me. You know, learning how to speak to people to where they can understand, you know, showing people how to do something, it it, it really helped me, you know, yeah. gain people's trust and, and be a good coach to them so they want to come back and keep doing it, keep doing it. And that's one of the things, like when I'm on a boat with somebody new, I like learning – their approach on things. And I like learning the way they do something because for me, you know, it's a learning opportunity. It's not just about how many fish we can catch, but how Mm -hmm. much better can I get? How can I learn something new here? And I feel like, you know, in that sense, I look at captains as coaches. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people, they do get on that boat excited to learn something new. Of course you have some people who I've got, you know, I've gone out with this guy and this guy and this is how they do it. And okay. But most people, they, they look at that relationship similar to a coach. Yeah. And, and, the biggest thing for anyone to, to know is if you go to an, an area and you book a captain, so listen to that captain. Mm-hmm. You know, it may be you may fish with someone in one town and book a guy that's only 10 miles down the road, but there's going to be little subtle variations mm-hmm. in just 10 miles, you know. So you always want to listen to that guy that you book, you know, listen to the captain. You may not agree with what he's saying, but listen to him and try what he's telling you because he fishes that water, you know, mm-hmm. and it's, it may be different from someone else right down the road, but something, you know, water bait, whatever may be a little different as well. So you always, you know, want to listen to us whether you agree or not. Yeah. And try something new, you yeah. know, and uh, I would think, too, that it was probably a pretty big transition to go from working all those jobs to guiding. Because, I mean, guiding can be, you know, five days on, a couple of days off, you know, versus five working five jobs is yeah, it's, seven days on, no days off. It was. I, and I kept a few of the jobs, you know, as, as I was building clients or, or, you know, a business. You know, bartending, 
I could kind of do whenever I wanted. You know, my a buddy of mine owned the place I worked at, so it was like, you know, hey, can I work tonight? Or, you know, can I work the next two days? Or, you know, so I still had some some help, some, some help supplemental come, income, yeah, some yeah. help coming along, and and every now and then I would still go in to chuck oysters at the raw bar because just because I I love to do it because I got to stand there and, and just talk to people mm-hmm. you know all day long which is, and I enjoy doing that is meeting new people and, and talking to them and it helps you know every now and then going in and you know some Get guy sitting there yeah. saying man you know anybody that can take me fishing and just hand them your card You're like you know if you want to go I'm available that's a great idea so I did that for a, a couple years into it and then right about my four year mark um, I knew about how many trips I'd run a year. And so I just went straight into, straight into guiding. So for you, that, that was kind of the thought process was once I get up to get my captain's license, start taking trips, start kind of deloading some of my, Mm -hmm. my work. And then once you had this goal in in mind, X amount of trips, that was when you made the, the leap. I mean, do you have any advice to somebody who is maybe at the very beginning of that time? Yeah. Uh, you know, don't don't throw all your eggs in that basket right off the bat. It's you've got to learn to kind of manage uh, your time because you're gonna be there's gonna be time where you're booked and there's gonna be a lot of time where you're not at all. And so, sitting around not being booked, you're gonna spend money. You know all this. So, always have some sort of a backup plan or mm-hmm. a little side hustle. Mm-hmm. You know to to kind of make up for those days. Uh, that you're not going to be on the water. Also, have a pretty good idea of, you know, whether people are going to want to fish with you or not. So, you know, like in my case, people went with me before I started guiding, you know, Mm -hmm. and they were like, man, this is awesome, you know, you should do this for a living or, you know, certain things like that. I'm like, okay, I I may have a a knack for this. Mm -hmm. You know, kind of know you can be a guide before you just – jump into it yeah um and take 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 buddies out take friends out yeah get take, a feel for it take people that don't fish be like hey you want to go take them and see if you can you can manage to to you know get them to catch you know some fish and not just like one fish you know yeah teach them or, or show them to where they can you know be consistent with catching fish don't just take your buddy who knows how to fish really well because that's that's not really what guiding is unless you're you know the upper echelon of guides who yeah. only take certain people you know but when you're just starting out you're gonna get a lot of people that don't have a, a clue what to do mm-hmm. and you know i ran into that right off the bat because you know i did a lot of artificial knowing how to fish throwing that well man you know you get a, a family of four you can't have kids and mom and dad throwing, a lot of hooks throwing plugs and stuff around you know you're gonna have hooks all in you so learning how to catch bait you know live bait and and rigging and stuff like that for people that have no idea what they're doing it that takes some time so mm-hmm. you, you need to know you know how to do that unless you're you're just going to go into fly fishing you know being a fly guide which then again you're only going to have about three out of the seven days a week that are good weather to go fly fishing, mm-hmm. you know, unless you're, you know, really, really good or, or whatever, but kind of have a backup yeah. plan or idea. Like, well, I like the idea of the side hustle piece too, mm-hmm. with a job that one is kind of flexible, but two, that allows you to build social relationships with people yeah. so that as you're out there talking, you know, shucking oysters, or work in a bar or a restaurant, you know, you can start to develop these relationships and say, yeah, I also run a, a charter fishing business mm-hmm. and then relay that. So that to me too, like when you talk about building the business at the very beginning, it's not just like, oh, I have to work the second job, but no, actually this is pretty no. strategic. The number one second job I would say is bait and tackle store. Go to a local bait and tackle shop and say, do you guys need help? Mm-hmm. Um, and that teaches you, you're, you know, you're in that setting of, of the fishing world anyway. And that teaches you people are coming in to ask you, hey, what do I need to use to mm-hmm. catch this fish? Hey, what should I use, you know, to go fishing? Or, hey, what, you've never been here, I've never fished. What, can I do anything to catch? You know, mm-hmm. like, can I fish off the beach or rent a boat or, or whatever? So 
working in a bait and tackle shop kind of already gets you going on how to interact with people that Mm -hmm. have no idea what they're doing. Um, And it builds those relationships. So if you work in a bait and tackle shop for a year or two, those same people keep coming in and they're Mm -hmm. like, man, what you told me, you know, last time worked, I caught a bunch of fish. I had a great time. You know, anytime you want to go fishing, let's go fishing. I'd love to go with you, you know, Mm -hmm. or something like that. You know, you build those relationships already kind of centered around fishing and then that can tell you like, Hey man, I need, maybe I need to start. And then you can start working out of, you know, mm-hmm. a lot of bait and tackle shops have guides that they refer to everybody. And, and that's one thing that helped me was the little shop that I worked for. You know, I could work one day a week on say Monday and people would come in, you know, and be like, Hey, I've got Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday open. I could fill, you know, the next four or five days of the week working that one day. Mm-hmm you know and that's that's a great way to get started um instead of just coming from you know a desk job mm-hmm. or something like that and jumping right into to guiding and being a hometown kid i would mm-hmm. imagine that you probably reached out to some people that you knew that were running guide businesses just to try to get some advice is that true uh a few of them yeah there and there wasn't that many um inshore guides when i was growing up in saint joe mm-hmm. uh a few of them, just old old timers, you know, and and I would talk to them about techniques and certain things like that, you know, just mm-hmm. being a kid trying to learn. Uh, but there really wasn't a whole lot of, you know, inshore fishing guides mm-hmm. um, when I was growing up. But the few that there were, you know, those old salts, they they didn't talk a whole lot about yeah. <laughs> where they went, what they did, you know. Yeah. They weren't passing trips to you probably no, too often. No, I like that. Nothing like that. Um, but, you know, there was a lot of people, you know, older guys around town that I knew fished a lot, knew how to fish, you know, and I would tug on their shirt tail and, hey, man, can you, you know, what would you use today, you know, as that kid, you know, what, where would you fish today? Mm-hmm. Something like, I wouldn't ask, you know, what they called and stuff like that. Just where would you go? Yeah. You know, stuff like that. And another thing I was curious about was, so you got a degree in biology, Mm -hmm. um, and then also your mom has a degree in marine biology, right? How has that factored in to being a guide? It seems like there'd be some obvious things, but... Yeah, so growing up with, you know, my mom, she's a a different breed of woman. She's the one who kind of taught me how to fish, uh, taught me how to love the outdoors and fishing with her with her having her degree was always a learning experience Mm -hmm. there was never anything that you caught or you know picked up out of the water that she wasn't explaining you know what it is how it works you know stuff like that she was always the smartest person i've ever met still to this day in my life but she was always explaining how things work and what Mm -hmm. things are um especially with the the marine aspect so it you know, another thing, being a kid, I just, that was an everyday thing, just absorbing all that. Mm-hmm. So when I went to school and got mine, it was kind of easy. You know, it was just like, I already know that. I actually mm-hmm. ended up teaching my professors a few things. Mm-hmm. Um, and which was, that's a whole long story, but it was pretty funny. Um, you know, and then coming back and, and doing the guiding aspect, you know, there's days that are slow. Mm-hmm. Fish just don't want to bite. They don't want to cooperate. The The degree part kind of helps me, you know, okay, well, fishing's slow. Well, let's change it up a little bit. Let's let's start, let's start showing people stuff, you know, mm-hmm. picking certain organisms out of the water or shells and talking to people about it, you know. Hey, there's this jellyfish or there's, you know, these dolphins, you know, or just starting to talk to people and teaching them, mm-hmm. you know, about their surroundings you know and and i've had a lot of people uh really like that and enjoy that and i've had people come back and book days that they just say hey let's just fish for an hour or two in the morning and then go show us something different you know Mm -hmm. something we haven't seen yet Mm. it's like okay you know and and so it's it's helped me in that regard and it's it's helped me learn you know not how to catch fish that you, there's not a book you can read that 
will you know truly teach you mm-hmm. that kind of stuff or when fish are going to bite or what mm-hmm. exactly are going to bite when that's just time on the water experience mm-hmm. being out there all the time um, but the degree aspect you know helps me with with water movement and certain things that are happening with the water or mm-hmm. with the surroundings that could potentially make us or help us catch fish that day mm-hmm. stuff like that. that's that's what's helped me and one of the things that you were talking to me about at lunch today was obviously you guys just just got through michael yes. and that has been i mean just such a devastating experience mm-hmm. and now things are starting to come back and bounce back and be good again and but you know and i'd love to hear a little bit about that um, in a little bit here, but one of the things that you had mentioned that made, I, I hadn't thought about was that yes, there's destruction is terrible, but at the same time, it brought in a lot of clean water and kind of in some ways washed that area out. Could you talk a little bit about that and how in some ways that's, that's helped with the water quality in your area? Yeah. So if, if you ask any true old salt, any old timer that's fished, he will tell you, you know, anytime after a, a tropical storm or hurricane, the fishing is incredible. And it and that's true. Um, it's kind of Mother Nature's natural flush, um, or like a forest fire. You know, mm-hmm. it, it it wipes everything clean slate down to the bottom, and what comes back is healthier and and prettier and a lot more alive. Mm-hmm. Um, and Michael did that uh, big time for us. It's it hit us in the teeth. I mean, it it devastated a lot of things. Land wise, you know, people lost homes and, and, you know, I went through it. A lot of people have a whole lot worse than what I, you know, am going through. But a lot of people don't realize that water quality, our water quality was, was dwindling bad. I mm-hmm. mean, there was all kinds of things going wrong with our, our water around St. Joe Bay and, and other areas. Uh, but that storm was mother nature's way of kind of, taking a broom and sweeping all that nasty stuff that had settled in the mm-hmm. bay in the bad water and flushed it right out. And mm-hmm. what came back was beautiful, pristine Gulf water. Uh, and it really helped. I mean, tenfold, a hundredfold. It helped our water quality mm-hmm. tremendously. And there's going to be a lot of people that, that maybe disagree or hate me for this, but I was, I was wanting a storm of some sort, not, mm-hmm. not a, you know, a cat five catastrophe by sure, no means. Sure. No one wants to go through that. I'll never want to experience that again. Um, but as a, as a fisherman and you know, what little bit of knowledge I have about the water, I was, I told a lot of my clients, like we need a storm, you know, a, a, a good tropical storm or a cat one. We need it for our water. We need it to get clean. And it's just not, it's not getting clean mm-hmm. and and most of that's you know runoff development and, it, and that's happening all over the state um but storms help the ecosystem yeah big time mother nature knows what she's doing yeah and we and we can in some ways on land we can recreate that we can do controlled burns we can exactly but when it comes to the ocean we can't do you uh, can't pull a plug and flush it and fill it back up and um, so you're dependent on mother nature mm-hmm. doing what she needs to do yeah and that's really the nature of the beast living in florida because um i was supposed to be at a conference for work and you know i didn't get a chance to go and they were all Mm -hmm. texting me i'm like hey sorry guys i can't make it you know our airport shut down the next week or so because of hurricane and to them they were like man uh, you know it's just they're so like you talk to northerners and they're so fascinated by Mm -hmm. hurricanes but you know i've i've missed work and had certain things canceled the past three years now, Cat 5, what we saw with Michael, and I want to talk about that in a minute, was tragic. Mm-hmm. But hurricanes are a way of life in Florida. It's it is. Just a, it's just a way of life here. And, you know, being able to see, okay, yeah, we're, we're not going to celebrate someone's home being destroyed or someone's business being washed up. No, of course not. But being able also to see the beauty in nature of the way that this is how this whole ecosystem works. I mean, mm-hmm. it's, it's flushing it out. It's bringing in new water. Mm-hmm. You know, Mother Nature's been doing that for a long time, a lot longer than we've been here. Mm-hmm. And it's 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 funny to me to, to see people, you know, they lose something. And I understand, you know, we lost, my grandmother's house got flooded and mm-hmm. 200 years of history of Apalachicola and, and my family's gone. Mm-hmm. You know, and we were sad for a little while, like 
But then again, it's just stuff. Um, but it's funny to me, people that gripe and complain, oh my God, I can't believe a hurricane, da, da, da. Mm-hmm. Well, you've got to understand that Mother Nature's been doing this t- stuff forever, for, you know, to help her. She's doing it for herself mm-hmm. to clean stuff up. You know, you're the idiot who built a house 100 yards from the water mm-hmm. in Florida. You know, you got to kind of, like you said, you know, people shouldn't, you know, get mad about stuff that Mother Nature does because she's going to do it. She has to do it. Mm -hmm. So when you lose something like that or you're in Mother Nature's path, it's just kind of, all right, she hit me this time. Hopefully she doesn't hit me next time. It's just stuff. And I mean, I was hours away from the eye in Tallahassee and I'm, it was hitting us hard in Tallahassee. I mean, I was, I had trees around my house that were getting bent about halfway over. We had multiple, multiple, multiple trees down. Mm -hmm. Uh, A lot of houses around mine getting hit. I mean, it was a powerful force, but one of the positive things that I was able to see through, um, through the whole thing was the way that the community got together. My dad was down at the boat ramp, clearing the boat ramp group of guys. I know from home Asasa drove all the way up Mm -hmm. to Mexico beach. Uh, with chainsaws and water and trailers and you really did obviously you see some people out looting and doing terrible things but most people like most most people it really did bring communities together oh they were no rallying doubt. together. It, it that was a big thing it's the only reason st joe and mexico beach and and panama city really survived was people helping people it, it had nothing to do with the government help and they didn't do anything you know they got credit for it on online or or on the news Mm -hmm. um but people helping people man i had i had friends um you know fellow captain scott uh him and his girlfriend drove in around the roadblocks and i gave him a back road or dirt road to take to you know to come in i had to drive five miles just to get a phone signal to call him and tell him how to get in but they drove two mile or two hours you know, the two days after the storm to bring me a generator and gas so I could keep, you know, my stuff going so I could go out and help other people. And they spent four days there chainsawing and working and, mm-hmm. and you know, sleeping in the heat. And it was people like that. I had other friends that drove three hours just to literally unload a bed of a truck full of supplies and turn around and drive three hours back, mm-hmm. you know. And, and it was incredible to see, you know, how far people go to help each other out. Mm-hmm. And, and it brought communities back together big time and it's sad you know that something like that has to has to happen for for the community to come together but what's good to see is even this far afterwards that we're still together you know it's it's back to joe helping joe you know Mm -hmm. instead of me driving somewhere to shop or ordering something offline man i'm gonna drive right downtown and go buy it because they need you know, they need help. They need as much money coming in as they can, you know, or so-and-so being a local person who doesn't really need to book a charter. Hey man, you know, let me book a day. Let's just so you can have some income. Mm-hmm. It's, it's stuff like that is, is, is 100% the only reason that the communities have survived and, and come back and then they will, you know, mm-hmm. with people helping each other out. I was in Panama city and I had this really cool moment where, uh, we were doing some cleanup for this lady. I was with the group and she rallied everybody. It's an older lady. She rallied everybody up. She rallied everybody up and she had a piano and she started singing amazing grace, that old hymn. Oh, that's and she cool. was playing the piano and I actually have video of it, but you can hear me singing in it. And I kind of got roasted cool. for my voice. I just got chills, but listen to that. I mean, it was such a powerful moment. Mm-hmm. And you know, we, I remember I'll, I'll just never forget driving into Panama City and every structure had roof blown off. Some of them had their walls blown out from the pressure. Just, I mean, just pop the, pop the walls off like a balloon. Mm -hmm. But to see people driving in, I mean, when I was in Panama City, you know, we were, we were doing, uh, um, some projects with the the North American mission board have a disaster relief program Mm -hmm. and they had a base station and they had it set up. And there's people from every state you can imagine, Arkansas, Tennessee, Georgia, Alabama. Oh, yeah. I knew guides on the ground in Mexico Beach. And to me, you know, what you said, Mother Nature is going to do what Mother Nature does. 
and we can see some positive in it because it's like you said, it's going to clean out that water. Mm. Fishing's really good after it. Um, and it's going to bring communities together and build some relationships and remind you that, you know, man, we're strong, you know, humans are resilient and especially the type of humans that live in Port St. Joe and Mexico beach. I mean, those are some tough people. Yeah. And when they get to get together, I mean, they can, they can bounce back and it's been really neat to see that. I mean, sure. The trees are broken, the houses are broken, but man, the people that I've talked to, man, their spirit's not broken. Oh no, and, it, it was, yeah, it was, it was a neat, neat experience is maybe not the right word. Um, surreal, whatever, but you know, the, the week or so afterwards where everyone was out cleaning, chainsawing, you know, um, what was cool to see was the locals, the, the true locals, you know, the people that have lived there their whole lives, mm-hmm. not the blow-ins that have lived there a year or two, which they, they I mean, they helped and, and they, they did their part. I'm not saying anything bad about that, but the true locals, I mean, the people that, you know, we've been through, I've been through five, mm-hmm. you know, nothing of this magnitude, but, you know, people are out busting their butts, chainsaw, and, but but cracking jokes, you know, mm-hmm. and and kind of laughing with each other, you know, and making it, as best a moment as they could in that situation. Uh, it was, it was, it was kind of, it gave you that sense of we're going to be all right. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just stuff. We're all going to, it's going to take a while to clean up. You know, we're still dealing with cleaning stuff up, but to see people that soon after, you know, and not everybody, I mean, there was Mm -hmm. a lot of people that were freaking out. Oh my God, what am I going to do? Uh, but the, the majority were, in good spirits right after you know Mm -hmm. it's like hey we're alive the only thing we lost was a house but you know if that's the biggest thing oh well we'll yeah we'll come back and and that was you know that kind of gave me a sense of we're gonna we're gonna be all right And, and with a lot of the help from the outside world i mean that that was the biggest biggest reason st joe's and not just st joe but panama city and other places are are back to normal Mm -hmm. somewhat normal and the fishing's good. Fishing's great, man. It's, it's been fantastic. One of the things that you said earlier, too, that I wanted to circle back to is when you were a kid um, and you said your words, you were a fat kid. Yeah, <laughs> I was. Um, you know, but that fishing had become an escape to you, mm-hmm. uh, a place where I guess you could go and find peace. And could you could you elaborate a little bit more about how that's factored into it? Uh, yeah, just, uh, you know, every kid has a bad day or, or whatever and finds their own little thing to do to mm-hmm. to get their mind off of it um mine was fishing and for me it was getting up early going out and really not focusing on catching fish you know of course i wanted to catch fish but mm-hmm. it was just to be out there be away from everybody people mm-hmm. just you know being on the water and just observe and just watch just you know, coming from my mother teaching me a lot of the stuff, but just watching, just seeing how, you know, Mother Nature and, and everything, they interact. Um, and that that helped me just clear my mind. And it still mm-hmm. does today. I mean, the day that I can't go out on the water and just be at peace and clear mm-hmm. my mind is the day that I'm, my fishing career is probably done. Um, but it's something about just being out there and watching, you know, watching nature be nature, watching mm-hmm. birds walk along the, the, the edge um, and and feed and watching, you know, redfish come up and hit a little bitty shrimp on the surface and make a, you know, giant explosion. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, just everything involved with it is, is how my mind got at ease and, mm-hmm. and then I, I you know, slowly just began to appreciate and love it just being out there Mm -hmm. and like i said to this day days i'm not booked if it's pretty Mm -hmm. i'm just going and there's days that i don't even make a cast you know i may see a school of 300 redfish and it's like i'm just gonna watch them see what they do Mm -hmm. you know i don't i've caught i don't know how many i've caught but i don't need to catch dozens yeah maybe one (laughs) you know but i just 
Yeah. I just want to watch, you know. And guess what? At that moment, I'm not thinking about anything else. Mm-hmm. I'm just watching what they're doing. No problem in the world is in my head other than just watching what's happening. And and the day that is gone is the day I'll go do something else. And just to see the way that everything is working together. You everything. Know, all the different pieces, you know. And I was at a wedding in um, north of Orlando, and they have Lake Apopka there. Mm-hmm. And I really, I've never been on Lake Apopka, so I wanted to go out and just look at it. And there's, you know, there's all sorts of legends around it. It's been pretty central to some of the conversation about some clean water in that area. And, you know, to me, it was really cool because I just took my wife out with me, and we were just looking at exactly what you said. We saw alligator, carp gar bass uh birds i mean everything mm-hmm. right and all these things kind of hanging out in the same water the same space working off the same ecosystem or today like i told you this morning you know we're pulling some bait traps and then you know we look over and 30 yards from us is a huge school of bonita just blowing up bait fish but then the birds are working it from up top and yeah. you know it's it's this really cool thing of like man i'm in the middle of this machine you know, and it's all working together and all these little gears are turning and clicking. And it seems to me like the people who appreciate that the most, who, you know, obviously people want to catch fish, but what you're saying, you know, just even being able to go out and just scout it, understand it, Mm -hmm. see it. The people who appreciate all of that the most are the ones who take the best care of it. Yeah, they, they definitely do. And, and this day you're seeing a lot of that around the state with, you know, all these organizations, um, Captains for Clean Water, CCA, mm-hmm. and different, you know, other ones that are are fighting to to save it, mm-hmm. you know. And it started with um, a couple of guys or, or a couple of ladies that, you know, like you said, appreciate it and, and observed to a point where they see there's a problem happening. Mm-hmm. Um, and it all starts with the water. And water quality or water period is – the reason Florida is here, Mm -hmm. you know, it's the reason people come to Florida. Um, and definitely the the ones that truly appreciate it and love everything about it, um, are the ones who are fighting to, you know, save it or, or doing their little part that they can to Mm -hmm. try to help out. And one of the things I know about you just from, the conversations that we've had is you're not necessarily somebody who's kind of like, look at me, look at me. I want to tell you about all the great things that, you know, I've been a part of, but I do know that you have been trying to help your fishery in your area be Mm -hmm. the best it could be. Could you kind of just tell us some of the ways in the past? I know you've done some stuff with CCA. Yeah. Um, I've done a few things. Um, I don't really like talking about things I've done, but, um, uh, me and another guy, uh, captain Mark house was a local captain over there. He, uh, he was real b- big into, into getting it going with me, but CCA, a mm-hmm. chapter in, in Port St. Joe. Um, and you know, through having banquets and raising money, they've put money back into, um, the area. We just recently released 8,000 juvenile redfish as part of theirs, like a little branch off of their red tide recovery for, mm-hmm the big problem in Southwest Florida had. Um, we had a whole lot of things in the works last year up until the storm. We were actually going to do a few things before Michael hit and it kind of put all that on halt. But, um, the redfish release, there was, um, something which not many people know this, but, uh, not a guides association, Mm -hmm. but I got all the local guides together um, uh, several years back, we had a really bad red tide about five years ago hmm. that almost wiped out our bay. Hmm. And, uh, I got all the guides together and, you know, didn't tell them what to do, but just asked them for a year or so, let's be conservationists, you know, let's not limit out every day on trout or redfish, you know, just, just try to you know, catch as many as you can, just try to, uh, get enough for people to have a meal, you know, one mm-hmm. meal and, and explain to them why, why this year we need to kind of woe back. Don't keep any large female trout, you know, mm-hmm. the big ones, the 23, four five and on up. Um, uh, and that goes with, you know, flounder. Everyone wants that big one, you mm-hmm. know, but 
you know, for a season. Let's just see what happens if we throw the big ones back. Let them lay their eggs, you know, uh, and not try to, you know, if you got five people on board, we don't need to keep 25 trout, Mm -hmm. you know, or five redfish. Let's say, hey, let's just get enough for you guys to eat tonight. Mm -hmm. Next year when y'all come back, we'll see what, you know, see if we can do something different. And a lot of them got on board, and a lot of them were were kind of, you know, throwing a little – fit about no i'm going to limit out every day you know that old school mentality um but the the majority of the guys got on board and they saw what happened you know we didn't wipe out the rest of our fishery and it came back pretty Mm -hmm. you know pretty good um so i've gotten and that comes from the education side Mm -hmm. is explaining to people why you know why we need to throw these big females back Especially mm-hmm. this day and age, there's a lot more people fishing in the state of Florida than there were 20 years ago. A lot, not just guides. It's it's weekend warriors, you know, and it's it's tourists coming down and and you know removing fish out of the water a lot more. So we as guides, if we want to do this for another 10, 15 years, or however long, we need to think about that span, not tomorrow mm-hmm. or today, mm-hmm. not about today. Um, so I'm big on, I mean, the first 30 minutes or an hour of my charter, I'm explaining to folks, you know, Mm -hmm. this is what's going to happen today. You know, we're going to try to catch as many as we can catch. I want to catch every fish out here. We're only going to keep what you guys are going to eat today. Maybe one more day. Mm -hmm. I'm not, I'm not filling a giant cooler full of food for you to take home and freeze and throw it away because you're coming back down next year and you still have all this. That's not how it works now, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and if you explain it to them, you know, why, most of them are like, you know what, that's that's pretty good. Let's do that. That's awesome. Um, and you get a few that, no, I want to fill a cooler and catch as, keep as many as we can. And that's, that's fine. You know, that's their mentality. That's fine. Um, but getting the guides on the same page and – getting them to explain why we need to do this will help a fishery out a lot. Yeah. You know, cause they're the ones every day, you know, sometimes twice a day running trips and, you know, and it's, and it's helped out my little neck of the woods, my little body of water. It's helped out tremendously. Yeah. You have any advice to somebody who maybe they're in a fishery that they really feel like, man, we need to do something here. We need to pull people together. We need to try to get people on the same page. Do you have any advice to them on how, how they could best do that? Yeah, just, you know, go to any tackle shop or look online and, and get all the numbers of the local guides there, you know, and, and give them a call and say, hey, let's meet up. You know, don't, you know, this social media deal with making your point on social media doesn't get a point across. Mm-hmm. People just swipe to the next thing or scroll down and mm-hmm. – the old the old way of doing things where face to face, you know, I'm gonna shake your hand, I'm gonna talk to you face to face, you kinda get a point across a lot better than, you know, blasting somebody on social media these days. So the best thing I can say is call these guys up, ask them to meet up, you know, and you can do it as a big group or you know, one on one. You know, mm-hmm. just like this. Mm-hmm. You know, one on one. Let's sit down, let's have a conversation about why I think we need to do this Mm -hmm. and let me hear your opinion on on what and 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 to be honest if a guy doesn't see a problem in their area he's not paying attention he's not a true guide you know he's not he's all about today he wants to go wipe out whatever he's he's not focusing on down the road Mm -hmm. so if he doesn't see a problem happening then he's not really doing his job Mm -hmm. you know these you, you get flack from these weekend warriors. All oh, the fishing's great. It's best I've ever seen. Well, you might have hit it really good one day or, or one weekend a month when the weather was perfect. Yeah. But on an everyday basis and level, it's not. You know, there's problems happening all over the all over the state, and, and it's different reasons. But the best thing is just sit down and have a conversation with a guy, you know, or, or get them all together in a group, you know, and – Maybe pay for everyone's meal. You know, hey guys, I got dinner tonight, and it may, you know, it's going to hurt your wallet a little mm-hmm. bit. But you can, you offer a guy a free drink and a, a free meal. Most of them are going to say, "All right, I'll see what the guy has to say." You know, if anything, I get mad at him. I got a free drink and a free meal. There but, you go. <laughs> you know, but I got his number to text him if he 
cuts me off or bothers me. Exactly. Or you know, yeah. but sit down and just say your piece, see what guys agree with mm-hmm. you. And, and if there's a bunch of them that don't you just say, look, you know, this resource is going to be gone in several years. You're going to be out of a job if you don't realize what's happening or help out all of us. Mm-hmm. And that's where it can start. And then you get all the local guides together. Well, guess where they can go? They can go to your, your local politicians, mm-hmm. which that's a whole nother deal. Um, mm-hmm. But, you know, then you can then you can go to the state level. You know, And that's how the Captains for Clean Water and other organizations have gotten started. It's a group of guys mainly fishing guides who see a problem they start talking they get on board they pull in a little bit of people from all different directions group gets bigger they go a little bit higher and that's that's how it starts and i like the local aspect of what you're saying too which is you know i i don't want to get on a social media rant but it's important for people to know the other people who are making their living on the water in their own backyard so that you can treat each yard differently because, Mm -hmm. you know, the fishery here is a lot different than some of the other fisheries east and west of here. And, um, that's, it's not a bragging thing. It's not, Hey, our fishery is doing great. Well, you know what? 20 years ago, this fishery is doing well, but now it's recovering and we got red tide factors. We got all sorts of factors in there and trying to understand what is, how well can I understand my fishery Mm -hmm. and some fisheries they can, they can support a five trout limit fine in some fisheries, like what you're saying, coming off a red tide or whatever, you know, trying to understand what should I lobby for in my own backyard? How well can I know this fishery here? And then talking with guys in that area, love them or hate them. Y'all are playing on the same playground. Yeah. And that seems to make a lot of sense to, to me. Um, I'd love to just kind of also talk a little bit about, you know, how you think about different seasons in your area, because I know that in the summer you do tarpon, Mm-hmm. And then you do, you also do some redfish, you do, uh, some snapper. Could you talk a little bit about the different variety of charters that you do and then how you think about it seasonally? Uh, yeah, I mean, I cover, you know, I, I kind of pride myself on, on being able to catch any fish, um, other than like a blue marlin, you know, cause I can't afford a boat to go out there and do that. Um, but you know, I have a bay boat and a skiff. So I kind of, you know, enjoy being able to target multiple species, not mm-hmm. just one fish or type, you know, species at a time. You know, some guys just do redfish in the winter and just do tarpon in the summer, mm-hmm. you know, and it's, to me, that kind of gets a little boring. You know, I still love to catch redfish and tarpon. Don't get me wrong, but um, I can target anything from any inshore species to near shore slightly offshore snapper mm-hmm. grouper kings um stuff like that mahi at times but uh it does change um you know spring springtime is is anything that's when if people say hey you know it's me and a buddy we kind of want to go after this you know a king mackerel or or whatever you know i'll tell them all right it's a little early or or you know probably won't catch any so let's Let's just target trout and redfish. You know, guy calls me in July, hey, I want to catch tarpon. Well, we're going to go try to catch tarpon, mm-hmm. you know. Um, so it does change. You know, wintertime is redfish. That's mm-hmm. that's my my personal favorite thing to do of all time is shallow water sight fishing redfish. Doesn't have to be fly fishing. You know, spinning rod is fine with me. Um but I love doing that. We only get a few months to do it. Can't make a living off of it all year. Uh, so, you know, I, I like to switch it up starting in the spring. Mm-hmm. Um, but one of my biggest enjoyments is taking families, mm-hmm. taking kids. I love taking kids. I don't have any kids of my own, but I love taking kids that want to be out there, not mm-hmm. kids that their parents drug them out there and they're, you know, they're miserable. They just sit there and pout. But, you know, these young kids that want to go do something out on the water and fish. If we can catch a trout, a redfish, a ladyfish, a bluefish, whatever at the time. Mm-hmm. I love watching their expression, their excitement, you know. Uh, that That is why I got away from just like tarpon fishing in the summer. Mm-hmm. Just targeting them. Because the weather's not always perfect for it. 
Mm-hmm. You know, there's always somewhere you can go catch a trout or redfish, no matter if it's overcast, windy, rainy. Uh, but just watching kids and, and families that have never done it or only get to do it once a year, I enjoy watching their excitement, you know, and, and the joy they're having lets me know I'm doing a good job and lets me know why I'm doing what I'm doing. Do you find too that a lot of people who maybe they catch a redfish with you, they're on the boat talking and then next thing you know, they're wanting to go out and catch a kingfish or go out like, do you see a lot of customers come through different seasons? Yeah. Um, and yeah, of course. And, and usually clients that are fishing, say a bay fishing trip, they're like, Hey, you know, do you ever go offshore? Do you ever target this? And I'm mm-hmm. like, yeah, we, you know, when the weather's right or conditions, we can do that. And so they're like, Oh man, when we come back next summer, can we go do that? Absolutely. If mm-hmm. mother nature lets us, we'll go do that. Um, and that's a big reason why I went to a bay boat, you know, um, that Pathfinder lets me do kind of anything I want, you know, mm-hmm. under certain circumstances with weather, but I can run 40 miles out, you know, on a nice day, grouper, snapper, kings, mahi, whatever, you know, or stay in and trout and redfish, tarpon fish, whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, a lot of the people, when they realize that I can go do something else, they want to go try it. Mm-hmm. Um, and that, that helps me big time. With redfish, how does your approach change from winter and then, let's say, a summertime or a springtime redfish? How are you thinking about things with that? Uh, so wintertime's shallow, you know. It's – and there's a lot of guides will probably hate me for saying this, but in wintertime, redfish want to be shallow. They want to mm-hmm. – there's not a bunch of bait fish around. Uh, they're targeting shrimp and crabs and – stuff like that. So they're going to be up shallow hunting that stuff, you know, and it's, it's usually those bluebird sunny days when that water warms up a little bit, they're going to push up shallow. Mm -hmm. And, and so wintertime is all about that shallow game. Mm -hmm. And what kind of boat do you use when you're going shallow in the winter? Uh, I have a little beaver tail predator now, uh, pretty cool little boat. Um, great little polling skiff or, Mm -hmm for sight fishing reds, uh, duck hunt a lot out of it too. Mm-hmm. Um, but any kind of, you know, shallow water polling skiff is, is perfect for that. Mm-hmm. I mean, I used to fish a lot off a of paddle board, um, just so you hmm. can get super shallow in the um, winter. That seems in, a little risky in the winter. Yeah. Um, you ever fall in? Yeah. If you fall in, it's, you know, eight inches to a foot deep. You just stand up and you get a little wet, but mm-hmm. it was, it was fun in the winter time. I just had my waders on. It's it's it, it's tough standing on a on a uh, paddleboard with waders. It gets a little gets a little tough, but uh, I I don't do much off a of paddleboard anymore just because mm-hmm. you know technology now with skiffs they float just about anywhere and then you got a motor that'll get you home and set up a paddle. Mm-hmm. Um, but going from winter to spring, uh, redfish will still be in shallow water, um, but when the bait fish show up late spring summer then they can be anywhere. Um, as the water temp gets super high, they're going to start pulling out in the deeper water. So then mm-hmm. you're, you're focusing, you know, three to six foot deep certain areas because uh, they're going to be chasing, you know, pilchards, pinfish, mm-hmm. stuff like that. Stuff that's uh, thicker, oilier. They, uh, they're not going to swim around all day long eating a bunch of little tiny shrimp. They're going to look for a couple big baits to eat mm-hmm. and then – just hang out the rest of the day. Now, th- there's a lot of nuance with chasing redfish in the shallow. How how do you try to talk clients through that so that they're not spooking them, they're being patient? Could you talk me through a little bit about your approach? Like, let's just create a scenario here. I'm on your boat with you. We're doing wintertime reds, and I've never done it before. I mean, how are you going to try to talk me through and teach me what's happening there and how to set everything up? Um, well, first thing I'm going to tell you, bring a good pair of sunglasses. Mm-hmm good pair of polarized sunglasses um do you have a pair that you think's the best i wear oakley's the the new oakley technology with their lenses is mm-hmm. unbelievable um you know and and they're all good smith costas maui gems they, they all work to an extent um these have been my favorite the tungsten prism lenses that these mm-hmm. oakley's have have been my absolute favorite and i've and i've worn them all uh, it's just my personal preference. They mm-hmm. work good with my eyes. Uh, they're 
a perfect all-around lens. You can see in bright sun. You can see in slightly overcast. Um, so I like those. Those are mm -hmm. my favorite. Um, but it doesn't really matter. I'm mm -hmm. not big on. I'm not going to make you go buy a pair of Oakleys. Um, but just as long as they're a good polarized mm -hmm. lens. So I'm, first thing I'm going to do is tell you that you got to be able to see. If you can't see, it's I can only coach you so much to where to where to put that bait. Mm -hmm. uh, the next thing is is to be patient and still. You got to be in shallow water. You can't be wiggling the boat, walking around. Just be patient. If you have a problem being patient, then shallow water redfish and tarpon fishing aren't for you. Mm -hmm. It's it's a lot of standing still, waiting. The next thing is never cast where you're looking. Because if you're looking at that fish, directly at that fish, and you cast on him mm -hmm. and hit him, well, how far do you tell your clients to lead lead a redfish? I say at least four feet. Okay. You want to put it four feet in front of them. Um, and I like I tell them to go past. So I always say make a long cast. Four feet in front, throw it as far as you can throw it. Mm -hmm. Because you can always make a longer cast shorter really quick. You can't make a shorter cast longer. Mm -hmm. um, so I say go go long you know, and try to put it four feet. Then you can always reel it up and then just let it sit mm -hmm. and wait for that fish to you know, come up to it. So, uh, I always say go past what you're looking at. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, usually takes, if you've never done it, it usually takes one or two, mm -hmm. you know, they always hit the first one. If you've never done it, they always drill the first one right on the head. Mm -hmm. And that's, and that's okay. Cause you're looking right at that fish mm -hmm. and human nature, you're going to throw where you're looking at. Mm -hmm. Um, so my biggest thing is just always go, you know, out in front and pass. Go, always just throw it far, as far as you can throw it. You can always reel it right back to them or strip it right back to them. Yeah. And well, for those who are practicing with a fly rod, a lot of times, let's just say that you're somebody who doesn't get a chance to actually go out on the water and cast at, at real fish. You know, a lot of times when you're practicing, you're setting up hats, plates, hula hoops, whatever, and you're trying to cast to those things. And mm -hmm. now you're excited and your your mind is registering what you practice. Muscle and memory, just cast to boom, it. Boom, right yep. on top of them. Um, what's funny about me is when I get excited, I, because I don't want to mess anything up, I, I overlead stuff like in certain circumstances with like a tarp in mm -hmm. or, you know, you know, so it'd be like, you know, somebody might say you need to lead that fish six feet. I might get excited sometimes and make the mistake of leading that thing 12, 15 feet. But it's like, you know, it's not always as easy to intercept them in certain scenarios. Mm -hmm. So it's just funny too, how like you try to practice and you try to practice with that excitement. But at the end of the day, you got to have that time on the water just to yeah. get used to it. Right. Because you know, this thing that you've envisioned in your head a hundred times while you're practicing or whatever, now it's here and you got a big red fish and in your face. It, and it all changes when that fish is actually there. Mm -hmm. You can practice as much as you want in the yard. It, everything changes when that fish is in front of you. Do you coach clients all kind of the same with the same tone regardless of who they are or do you find yourself morphing that a lot to how you feel like the client will best receive it i mean what's because when i picture a high school coach i don't necessarily picture hey man you dropped that ball no worries man we'll get you another one we'll, we'll throw another ball to you we got you you know so how what's your tone like on the water with clients could, when you're in these scenarios where they really do need to make these casts uh that that changes from client to client um I'm very patient and calm with people that are new that never done it. You know, it's, you can't yell at someone who's never done it. Uh, now if I'm taking, you know, people that I've taken fishing a lot of times before or someone I know really well and comfortable with, mm -hmm. you know, I'll, I'll bark at them a little bit, you know, like, you know, I'm not going to say it on here, but you know, like, you can do better than that. Mm -hmm. You know, you know how to do, you know, just stuff yeah. like that. I'll, I'll get a little aggressive with them, mm -hmm. especially if it's, you know, one of those days where I know we're only going to have a few shots. Like you've got to make them happen. Mm -hmm. And, but with new people, no, nah, I mean, it's, they've never done it. So they're already having a good time. You know, why would I yell at them or me get frustrated? And if they've never done it, mm -hmm. you know, they're, they're experiencing something completely new just let them enjoy it. You know, it's their fault if they mess up. It's not mine. Mm -hmm. I can coach them all I want. In the end, my job is to put them in front of, you know, a fish to catch. 
It's their job to catch it. Yeah. Most so, people know when they make a bad cast. Yeah. So you don't need to yeah. bark at them, especially, you know, so, you know, I, if I feel comfortable and I'm good at reading people, mm-hmm. you know, if I'm feeling pretty comfortable, I'll give them a little jab, you know, mm-hmm. or, t- or tell them, you know, to talk about fly fishing in particular, but this is true if it's been a tackle. They might know they made a bad cast, but they might not know why. why? Yeah. Or you might tell them why, and then they might do it again, and mm-hmm. they might do it again, and then you might start getting just naturally yeah, and, frustrated. Yeah, and I'm I'm good. I'm good about telling them why that fish didn't eat that. Mm-hmm. You know, and I don't know exactly why not. It's a fish. Mm-hmm. I can't read his mind, but usually, it, hey, your cast was like this. That fish probably didn't want it because of this. Mm-hmm. So it's got to be, and it's like with with tarpon, like we were talking about earlier. You know, tarpon's got very small strike zone. Mm-hmm. You know, they'll eat anything, but they're looking for a bait in a certain little zone. And if if it's not coming in that zone at a right angle or or at the right time, they they could care less about it. Uh, or for you know, for a fish that big, they're scared to death of everything. If it's coming straight at their head or from the side or you know, straight onto their their mouth a lot of times they're going to run from it it's got to be just right and that that's what i'll explain to people like this is why that fish didn't eat because your bait wasn't quite doing this you've got to get it in that zone and with like redfish you know winter time they're looking down they want to eat 90 percent of the time they want to eat something that's underneath them Mm -hmm. Um, so if you're stripping something or or reeling something really fast to them sometimes it'll freak them out because they're not used to seeing live baits or baits that time of year they're looking Mm -hmm. down for something crawling across the, the bottom so that's what I'll I'll explain to people is like, hey, you know, your cast wasn't that great. And this this is why the fish didn't eat it. So let's try to make it look like this. Mm-hmm. And I'm sure they enjoy the biology kind of to tie it back to to your degree, like the biology piece too of like this time of year. This is what they're kind of thinking. Mm-hmm. This is what's going on. You know, they're, you know, you're helping them understand how that ecosystem's working so that they can try to mimic what needs to be mimicked yeah. in that moment, especially with something like a redfish or. Um, and you said redfish is your favorite species to target. If you yep. could only target one fish. Yep. Redfish. That'd be it. Absolutely. What, what's your favorite non-flats fish? Oh, uh, probably cobia. Cobia. Which cobia get on the flats at times yeah. in certain areas. But for us where we are, um, the migration we get along the beaches is one of the coolest things mm-hmm. ever to me. And you have a tower, right? Yep. Little half tower on my pathfinder what's your what what's your favorite way to fish for cobia just idling down the beach wait until you see one you know swimming on the surface man it's it's a it's a neat spectacle you've got this huge long looks like a you know a log floating on the surface and he's just mm-hmm. cruising down the beach minding his own business and when that's right they will eat anything and the aggressiveness they have to eat that is mm-hmm. unbelievable um and they taste great absolutely taste good but they're they're unbelievable fighters and it's just a very visual you know bite and the good thing about them is you usually get a couple shots at them Mm -hmm. you know you'll if you bang them on the head just kind of hang out you'll see it pop up down the beach a little ways Mm -hmm. you know sometimes they'll leave but if they miss a bait they'll come back so Mm -hmm. they're they're pretty neat and we only get uh, you know a month maybe a month and a half to target them so Mm -hmm. it's um it's definitely one of my favorite times and not to offend anybody but they taste good too. They taste great, man. It's it's one of the only fish that I'll keep to eat, you right. know, because uh, I haven't eaten a redfish in probably 15 years. I think I know another one you probably keep. What's that? Triple tail. Uh, I will keep one a year. One a for year. For myself to eat. I will. Yep. I bet that's a ceremony for you. <laughs> it is. How are you going to cook that one? <laughs> on the grill, man. I'm going to throw it on the grill. Um, hmm. Any uh, special seasoning? On the half or? shell. You know, okay. You know redfish on the half yep. shell? Triple tail in the half I've never shell. Done triple tail in the Man, half shell. I'm telling you, it's it'll change your life. Right. Um, that's an old old trick. Um, well, I keep two a year, so I'll try that. That's hey, one. that's fine, man. And it, and there's you know there's nothing wrong <laughs> no, with it, it. But so like a redfish is my favorite of all time, and, and I always make a joke as a redfish saved my life. Mm-hmm. Back when I was a kid, you know, that's what I caught. That's what mm-hmm. I targeted. That's what helped me through bad times. Was a redfish. Mm-hmm. Uh, I make a lot of money and get to see a lot of people make memories on targeting redfish. So for me, I cannot keep one to eat. It's mm-hmm. just, you know, it's, it's, I don't know. It's just something I can't do. I'm all for 
taking people if they want to eat some, you know, yeah. hey, we're going to keep one or two for y'all to eat. No problem. Uh, but for triple tail, the very first one of the year I catch, I always throw it back. Mm-hmm. Um, I grew up, that was the fish that me and my mom and my grandma took. That's what we went and caught. You know, that's mm-hmm. what we were going after every time we went was triple tail. And so the first one of the year is, is, is released, you know, kind of, you know, ceremony. Yeah. To yeah. them, like, thank you. And then I'll keep one a year. I'll keep another, you know, five, six pounder or something for mm-hmm. me to eat. That's it. And that was way before triple tail were cool. I was, I, I grew up catching them before e- people even knew what triple tail were. Mm-hmm. Um, and I feel kind of bad about for the fish, man, because 10 years ago, no one really knew what they were, you know. And, and another thing with social media is they, they've made it a cool fish to target because they're, they're a neat fish to, mm-hmm. to catch because it's visual. You get to see a lot of them. Um, they're such a cool little fish to, mm-hmm. you know, to they catch. Jump. They'll yeah. jump, they'll dig, they'll wrap you around stuff. Uh, you know, they float. Sometimes they'll bite and you never even know it. it's in its mouth. He'll swim back to the boat with it in its mouth and you never felt him. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, man, I, I grew up catching them. And you said your grandma would fish with you? Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. I, I mean, you know, it, it's pretty unique to have moms that fish and grandmas who fish, like seriously fish and not just hop on the boat. I mean, what was that like as a kid? How did that shape you? Uh, it just, you know, it, it was it was what it was. It's how I was raised. My, my dad wasn't in the picture a whole lot other than sports when I was a kid. Mm-hmm. Um, but wasn't an outdoorsy guy. Uh, my grandfather was like the hunting aspect and the mm-hmm. farming and the working hard. My mom and my grandma were my fishing buddies, man. It mm-hmm. was, my mom can still to this day throw a cast net better than any man I've ever I've seen. seen it, I'm yeah. telling you, man, she's, she's, she's pretty neat lady. But my grandma was, you know, I, we could sit on the beach or on our dock and fish for hours and not catch a thing, mm-hmm. you know, and just, and that's what we did. We fished, just her and me, just hanging out fishing all day that's in awesome. the summertime. So, you know, I didn't know anything different, yeah. you know, it's just how it was, but it was, you know, I still get the same, you know, kind of reaction from people when I say, you know, oh, I bet you and your dad, you know, fished all the time. He taught you. He's like, no, mm-hmm. my mom and my grandma. And they're like, that's different. Yeah. And there's definitely more awareness now that there are a lot of great women anglers mm-hmm. and there's a lot of awareness to that now, but you know, obviously there was a long ongoing stigma about it mostly being a male dominated hobby sport, mm-hmm. whatever you want to call it industry. And it is cool to hear about people who, you know, they just love the fishery. They, they love to fish. They love to pass it down to their kids, to their grandkids. And, you know, I'm going to just assume that your grandma's not some sort of bikini post in Instagram, you know, nah. cause those are, you know, you know, that's common too. You know, let's just take some pretty girls out on the boat. We'll catch a fish, upload a couple photos of them. And, and really, I mean, really just it, it, truthfully disrespect the women and make them mm-hmm. some sort of objectify them versus somebody that actually loves the fish. And it's cool to hear that in your lineage that, you know, you had a, you have a, a grandma who passed it to your mom, who passed it to you and you get to do it for a living today. I think, I think it's awesome. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I'm, I, like I said, I don't know anything different. You know, it's just how I was raised, and mm-hmm. uh, I think it's pretty neat. My, I mean, I fish. I take my mom fishing every Mother's Day every year, mm. uh, and uh, we usually do a little offshore, near shore trip when mm-hmm. the weather's nice. And it was this past year was was neat. My my grandmother just passed away in April mm-hmm. of this year, um, so like. This Mother's Day was a little was a little different, so I was like, you know, I asked my mom, "What do you want to do?" She goes, "You know what? Let's just go mullet fishing. Hmm. Let's just go like we used to. Let's go throw the cast nets. Okay, let's go." And we got in the John boat and we mullet fished all day, hmm. and it was just, you know, it's it was one of those things where I kind of sat back and was like, "Man, this was a neat way to grow up." You know, hmm. not not many kids got to, you know, grow up that way around here or Mm -hmm. whatever but it was it was fun and i i'm truly grateful now you know looking back on it that i had women like that to teach me Mm -hmm. 
Well, and you said that you used to go away during the summer and be away from TV and phones and everything. Oh, yeah. And, you yeah. Know, when I was a kid, I had a, the same thing. I, I didn't live in a neighborhood until elementary school, and we didn't really have TV or anything mm-hmm. like that. And I was a kid. I, you know, I, I didn't know any different either with that sort of thing. I mean, my dad worked for FWC, so all I really knew was just kind of running around and doing whatever my parents put me in the car and took me to do. You know, yeah. you don't think about things critically. But I look back and I'm really grateful that I learned how to have fun and just enjoy those moments without technology. Yeah. And how, how has that shaped you today as far as the, the technology piece? And has that kind of impacted the way that, that you fish or run your business? Or Yeah. Um, you know, I, I tell people all the time to this day, if I didn't run a business, I wouldn't have a smartphone. I'd still have a flip phone. Just, um, you know something I can call and maybe text, but I didn't get a cell phone until I was in college. Um, all my friends in high school had them, everybody. Uh, I didn't want one, didn't need one. I was either playing ball or fishing or at the house. Uh, but, you know, nowadays with running a business and social media and all that, uh, it's a necessity, unfortunately. But, yeah, it's – with my business, it's – you know, I'm not on my phone all the time. I'm not using – you know, crazy, you know, apps or whatever. Yeah. Apps or I'm not, I'm not sitting there trying to Snapchat or, or story, you know, every fish my client catches, you know, cause it's not about that. It's, it's about me, you know, they're paying me for my time. So it's about me being with them mm-hmm. for that time. And it's not about me holding my phone in their face. And if they want to do it to an extent, I'll let them. Mm-hmm. Um, but with anything else, you can't let them show a bunch of spots on social media and advertise it because there's going to be people fishing it sure. the next day. So, um, but I'll tell them if you want to take pictures and videos for yourself, I'm all for it. I'm not going to be on my phone doing it. You know, mm-hmm. I'll take pictures of your fish once they're caught. I'm not going to, you know, be on my phone trying to land a fish and record us catching one because what if you lose that fish while you're doing it? Yeah, um, well, and, I, and some- I'm not. I'm not knocking anybody that does that. I'm just saying for me. Um, I'm not big on the technology and, and having to capture every single thing on the camera. Oh, well, Lord um, forbid somebody think that you didn't catch a fish five well, counties away. Exactly. You've never you met. Know, yeah. Come fishing with me and see what happens. So um, I don't have to record every minute of it. And I just think it takes me away from mm-hmm. them, you know, because unfortunately it's only a short period of time, you know, you get to be with them. Mm-hmm. Um, so, especially when they're paying you for it, like they need my hundred percent attention on them, not with a camera or, a, and if you want to put, you know, GoPros and I tried that, but I'm just not a big, I don't really care for all that stuff. Yeah. I, I tried to do GoPros when we first started this and even on the bow and the Rob Fordyce podcast, mm-hmm. we tried to do GoPros and we would talk and we'd say, you know, somebody would say, you know, yeah. And then I would go down to the beach and then it would like beep and be like, go, f- go pro photo, you know, mm-hmm. and stuff like in the background. And I was so embarrassed because I didn't know how to use the technology, but yeah. you know, that's the two more questions. I think as we round it up, that I'd be interested in one is, um, if you could go back in time and tell yourself anything at the beginning of guiding, when you first started, what, what would you tell yourself? Uh, and I don't know. Um, that's that's a tough one to answer. I really, I really don't think about stuff I've done in the past. You know that got me here. Mm-hmm. Everything I have done in the past has got me to where I'm at now. So, and I'm I'm at a place in my life and business that I'm extremely happy. So I don't know mm-hmm. if I would change anything. Maybe to pay attention more. I know it's hard to do, uh, but pay attention to everything a little bit more. Just, you know, even though I did as a kid observe a lot, just just slow down in, in every aspect. You, you know, dealing with people. Um, yeah, just, just slow down and, and kind of observe and absorb everything. Mm-hmm. And some little thing along there would you know i'm sure would have helped and this is this is vague but purposely vague but what does success look like for you happy clients hmm. that's success 
smiles. Um, you know, I'm not big on, I don't care how much money I make. I want to make enough to be happy and, you know, comfortable in life. I don't care about being a millionaire. Uh, be nice, but mm-hmm. oh well. But success to me is happy clients, whether I'm running 10 trips a year or 400 trips a year. Mm-hmm. Smiles um, and people enjoying what I get to enjoy every day mm-hmm. for one day, if they're enjoying it, that's success to me. Mm. That's good. And if people want to follow you, what's the best way to follow you? Uh, saltwater Obsessions. Um, Instagram is saltwater underscore obsessions. Facebook, Saltwater Obsessions, or just Jordan Todd. Uh, either one of those. I, I don't have a Twitter. Mm-hmm. I had one. I don't even know what the password is to get into it. I don't know. <laughs> I don't, I'm not big on tweeting or doing yeah. any of that. But yeah, any of those. Um, phone numbers on all that. They can call, contact. Want to go fishing, want to chat. Any of that stuff's fine with me. Yeah. Come in and stay at a hotel and eat dinner and yeah. help support that that city uh, hotels are tough to find right now around st joe but uh, a lot of rental places are coming back Mm -hmm. um we've got one mainstay that's back up and running but a lot of the rental shops are our rental houses are are coming back to to normal um but yeah the the best thing for for my community is is come spend money Mm -hmm. you know i know people have boats and can come down but maybe leave your boat home this summer and you know book not just book me one or two, but book several guides maybe. You know, I know it's some, you know, a lot of money uh, for some people, but, you know, book a couple guides for the week. You mm-hmm. know, go out to eat more instead of eating in. Uh, stuff like that. The, the, you know, the little shops there in, in town. That's the best way that St. Joe's going to recover now um, is people spending money in the town. And and it, it, and it people are doing it. I, this was – this last month uh, – month and a half it's been it's been pretty uh eye-opening as far as the amount of people that are down and and helping the town out and Mm -hmm. i think i think it's been really good and i i know we're going to be okay Mm -hmm. you know maybe a couple more years but everyone's doing all right well i'm excited to check it out yeah man thank you awesome thanks for being on the podcast yeah appreciate it Hey guys, before you go, if you're enjoying this podcast, I would love to ask two quick things from you. First, that you would subscribe, rate, and leave a review on iTunes or wherever you're listening to this, and also that you would continue to share the podcast. Your help can go a long way. Thanks for listening to The Captain's Collective.